This Week in Startups is brought to you by NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. Get NetSuite's free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits, when you go to netsuite.com slash twist. Squarespace. Turn your idea into a new website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code TWIST to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Upcoming launch events. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due December 23rd. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. Today on the program, I have a founder who is in the vending machine space. And you're like, oh, really? Vending machines like Coca-Cola? No. This vending machine I ran into at an airport. And I walked by. It had a beautiful display. And it was showing this incredible farm-fresh produce, eggs, chicken. And I said, wow, this looks like the future. Let me go check this machine out. And there were two or three people kind of not using it, but trying to figure it out. And it was a standard vending machine, looked a little different than a Coca-Cola one because it had a big, beautiful screen on it. And I tried it and it was amazing. And the name of that machine is Farmer's Fridge. You can go take a look at farmersfridge.com. Uh, and the name of that founder is Luke Saunders, and he's with us today on This Week in Startups. Welcome to the program, Luke. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, so I'm in the I'm in an airport. I mm -hmm. can't remember, but I'm in an airport, and okay. I'm walking by. It might have been Dallas or something, and I see this machine. I guess here's Fast Company uh, doing a little video of it, and um, these little jars came out of it, beautiful little jars after I ordered, and there were some nice forks there, and I got a couple of eggs. I got a little salad. I got some chicken. And I was like, this is perfect because I want to eat healthy when I'm on the go. And there is no better description of on the go than at an airport. And I said to myself, wait a second, are these, is this fresh or not? I had all these questions. And this machine kind of explained it very nicely. And I then sat down and opened my three little jars. They look like jars of, um, I don't know, yogurt or maybe that uh, pickles might come in. Very well done. And I ate the food. I said, this is amazing. This is the future. Um, let's find this uh, founder and bring him on the podcast. So tell me a little bit about Farmer's Fridge, when you started it, um, and where you're at now. And why did you start it? Yeah, no, um, great starting point. So uh, I founded the company in 2013. We're okay. actually- uh, Six almost, years ago. Yeah, almost to the day, six years ago, we, we opened and sold our first salad. Um, so it was the third week of October in 2013. Uh, Got it. And from a vending machine. It was from a vending machine, yeah. Because wow. actually, um, you know, believe it or not, when I was getting started, you know, one of the core things I would tell people, like, hey, I think that I could uh, re-architect the way that that people think about food and and the supply chain for this, and um, you know, the end point of distribution would be a vending machine. So, like, would you buy lunch from a vending machine? Um, if it were high quality and, and cheaper. And a lot of people would actually say no. They were like, why would I ever do that? And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so despite yeah. giving them a value proposition, which is absolutely undeniable, it's yep. cheaper, it's yep. faster, yep. Um, and it's better mm -hmm. because it's higher quality straight from the farm. Yep. People said no. Yeah, I think like in the abstract, when you walk them through it, they're like, why would I ever do that? And, you know, what was the, what we, aside from the it's different, yeah. did you get the objection to a more detailed point? To a no, more specific and, and, one? And no, and actually, that's part of how I knew that this we were on the right track because nobody could actually give me a good answer uh -huh. about why not. And so, you know, at this point, six years ago, it was really like, I'm going to get this thing up and running and I'm going to prove that what you say you're going to do and what you're actually going to do are two different things because there's no like again people didn't have a really good reason i was like let me get this straight to your point it's cheaper it's more convenient and it's going to taste at least as good if not better yeah um because it'd be more fresh in a lot of ways and and so like nobody could actually give a good answer other than why i you know it's not a restaurant and that's really not you know when you yeah. think about what is a restaurant it's a place you go and you buy food. And most people buy it because they want the cheapest, best tasting, most convenient thing. I mean, just to get to first principles, yeah. we're humans, we need food. Exactly. This provides yeah. food. Yep. We have to pay for food. We have to wait for food. So you can buy food and get it faster. It should be a big win. So you as a founder mm -hmm. had that conviction. Yep. 
Users are telling you they don't want it. When did you know that users don't know what they actually want? Uh, And how did you convince them? Because that it does seem like I experienced what you're talking about, which is hovering around the machine. People were hovering around that machine. Yeah. Um, Trying to figure it out because they'd never seen it before. Yeah. So it it really, um, the feedback was good. Like I understood, okay, there's a barrier to overcome here. Right. And I can't, the, the machine at the time is thinking the machine is um, it's not going to be able to like talk to people in the mm-hmm. way that someone who works in a restaurant can, right? Like it, it can't walk outside and talk to people on the street. So everything about it has to speak to freshness. Got it. Has to speak to a premium experience. Has to, so like ah. everything when I was getting started was what would you do to make a vending machine feel like a restaurant? Got it. So we, we had it wrapped in reclaimed wood. I spent, um, you know, twenty five hundred dollars on this massive neon sign that went on top. Um, I had uh, this big block of astroturf in front of it with stanchions, so that it created like lines, and it just ah. lots of little cues that made it feel like a restaurant. Behavioral cues, yeah. things that our reptilian brains could be like, "Yes, it, this is what I'm supposed it, to do." There's a cue. Get exactly. in it. Exactly. Yes, and we even we even invested like this food court that we were in was a total dump. Yeah. And so I went out and I bought a bunch of plants and I spruced up like the area around it ah. with those freshness cues and live plants and yeah. just everything we could think of to make people feel differently. And, then, and actually the packaging itself, which um, it was really hard to find something that could merchandise the product and look fresh and appealing. And my brother-in-law was like, you should really try mason jars. It's a really great way to, to and I went on Pinterest and I found this and like, this is um, actually not going to work for me because I'm trying to get people to buy from a vending machine and that's just too much yeah. of a barrier. Well, and the I, mason jar thing became a phenomenon. Mason well, jar salads yes. are beautiful. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but if you type in mason jar salads on the interwebs, you will see like a layer of green, a layer of red, some green well, beans, some Exactly. Whatever. And and that's where- gorgeous. Here and, they are and, on the and, screen. Yeah. Exactly. And so we actually, like initially I pushed back on this idea uh, cause it, even that, it seemed like I'm adding a layer of, uh, friction with the vending machine itself. And now I've got to convince people to buy it out of a jar. But once I saw right. the images, it was very clear. Like that's a great way to show mm. the transparency of the product and how each ingredient is layered and all that stuff. So we, right. we did end up launching that way. Um, and, and so everything about the machine was, how is it fresh? How does it feel like a restaurant? Um, and then I had, uh, myself and two people stand at the fridge for four hours a day and just talk to people, explain it, um, really help them understand. Mm. And that was really critical to, to sort of building an initial critical mass around uh, you know, how, how the process worked, where the food came from. And so when I knew it was working is about a week in, I'd had multiple customers that had been back every single day. <gasps> And really? so, yes. And so it was just very clear. Like I started to get to know them. Um, and in some ways it was bittersweet because I knew that was not going to be like a scalable way to operate yeah, the business. Maybe, but. maybe not. Right. I mean, if a, if the machine can service as mu- as many consumers as let's say a fast casual stand, those typically have two people working in them. And if you cut one person out and just had one person there, you'd be saving half the labor cost, not 100%. And you're not making it there, so you save all that labor. And you, the space footprint is what, 20%, 10%? Uh, yeah, it depend, like, you know, depends on the restaurant. But I think um, even kind of going back in time to why I started the business, the whole idea was how do you bring fresh, healthy food to places that it could not go? Was that the original like driving force? And then you said vending machine or were you in japan and sort of vending machines allowing people to buy underwear and yeah. everything in the world and you're <laughs> like why don't we buy underwear from vending machines in america uh so so definitely the former like my okay. so before this um i'd been like a small business entrepreneur i had a um, bike rental company in college i sold it when i graduated and i went to work with my dad in a family grease lubricant manufacturing business so um you know it's basically uh, half a million dollars in revenue, like in a garage in Long Island City, Queens. And they were losing a ton of money because it was 2009 when I graduated. So uh-huh. so I took this job. I'd worked there in the summers and he's like, I could use some help. Um, and I thought this would be a great chance to really understand how a business works. Yeah. 
And right in the middle of the Great Recession. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant timing. Yeah. So as soon as I started, he's like, oh, by the way, I can't uh, afford to pay you. And I really, we, you know, we have no money left to like- We're run probably going out of business. Yeah. The whole family's <laughs> ruined. Yeah, but uh, see you Monday, so, 9 a.m. Yeah. So it was Break pretty, donuts. Um, it's like a trial by fire experience. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was really actually- paraphrased. Did your family lose everything, in fact? Uh, pretty close. Like yeah. they sell their house, like, you know, sell cars and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But we were able to turn the business around. And actually grow it over the course of a few years. So we moved it from uh, New York to New Jersey, like retooled the whole thing um, and got it stable and profitable again. And so again, it was like still pretty small. But so you did a, a turnaround. It's your first job. Yeah. It was In great. the middle of the financial crisis. Yes. Good on so, you. Um, so, but it was a good, like really small case. Uh, and I loved it. But then my wife got into law school in Michigan. And uh-huh. so I needed to get a job in Michigan. Um, and... It was uh, basically like, what could a guy who's done grease lubricant manufacturing do? Uh, not a whole lot, it turns out. No. And so I got a job as a metal finishing salesman. And uh, metal finishing, in, in case you're not familiar, is like the uh, industrial version of a nonstick pan. So you oh. go into factories and engineering teams and you sell them coatings for oh. metal. It's basically like a materials business. Um, for them to spray or paint onto... So they, they actually, it was, it was, a lot, yeah. it was even harder. Like they, we'd have to, I'd have to convince them, uh, sight unseen to send me their parts so I could coat them and send them back. How do you coat them with a spray gun or something? So you dip them it, it, in a it's vac? a combination. We did all kinds of coatings. So you, you had spray coatings. Um, wow. you had like dip coatings. There's like, uh, Crazy. uh, auto catalytic type coatings and also. So you like really the, learned yeah. how to build on a very basic level, mechanical objects, physical stuff. Yeah, and well, manipulate atoms in the real world. Yeah, sort of. And, and more importantly, in that job, um, it's like what I realized is a lot of this stuff is just kind of hacked together. So, like big food plants are uh, taking all this engineering and sort of they're building a custom machine to make granola bars or uh, pizza or whatever they're doing. And um, I also got a really good look at the supply chain for food. And so I was going into a lot of the food manufacturing plants. And realized that the biggest constraint was actually the amount of time it took to get a product from the factory to the consumer. Huh. And so a lot of times it was like six months for the granola bar that was getting made to go to the gas station down what? the street. Yeah. Because like, um, there's, distribu- there's warehouses and distributors and sub distributors, exactly. local distributors. Yep. Yeah. So like, so. Um, what a waste. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like it's, it's very efficient at reliable, cheap calories, but not necessarily like fresh meals. And then the other end, you have- Yeah, six uh, months for your eggs are not a great window. No, Don't want to eat that six-month-old mason jar salad. No, definitely not. And so, and then the other end, I was like basically only fast food restaurants in those places. And so to the original idea, it was, well, if I can compress the supply chain for fresh food uh, um, and leverage this, uh, the idea of centralized manufacturing with um, points of distribution that have a different unit model than a restaurant- I could solve Ah. the problem for making fresh, healthy meals more accessible. So So you had this great insight on the back end about the the distance and the flipping of food between producer, distributor, and retailer and and a couple of other parties in the middle. Yep. And so you're like, wait a second, this is a distribution chain problem and it's a consumer adoption problem on the last mile. Yes. And it's a packaging problem. So you decided to take something that had three or four different incredibly challenging parts and then put them all together. When we get back, I want to know how you made the actual vending machine. And I want to know how many vending machines there are in the world, because I understand you've raised almost over $40 million now for this vision. I want to know about that too. But really, I want to know how long did it take to make the first machine? Did you use somebody else's? And then uh, how many are out there now when we get back on This Week in Startups? Hey, everybody. I'm here with my friend, Jason Maynard, who works at NetSuite. Tell everybody, what do you do, Jason? You know, I do I do many things here at NetSuite, but I run the field operations for the business unit. And field operations means what? In Sales, context? marketing, business development, all the stuff in home in terms of how we acquire customers, take care of them, service them, make sure they're happy. I know what NetSuite does, but for people who are listening, what's the right moment for a startup to engage with NetSuite? Is it at 10 employees, 50, 100, at 1 million in revenue, 10 million, or 100 million in revenue? It's a good question. I think people should engage with NetSuite when they start to lose control 
over the visibility in their business. It. So it depends on if you're, if you're a venture back company, that can happen pretty quick because once you start raising money, then all sorts of pressures and expectations come on you. We deal with some family owned businesses and other startups who may be a little bit later in their life cycle, but it's really when that complexity takes its toll. What's the amount of effort I should expect to put into implementing NetSuite at my company? Is it a 10 hour process, a one hour, a 10 month, a 10 week, 10 day? You know, we've been we've been focused more and more over the last two, three years to make that as simple as possible and, and, and sort of simplifying our packages. So if you're a small business just getting started, raised an A round or something like that, you know, we should be able to get you in in 30, 45 days, get you up yeah. and running. And our goal is to make it as simple as possible for you. And so that hopefully can get you what you need to remove the initial layer of complexity. And then as you grow, you can you can add more of what you need. All right, right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, the seven key strategies to grow your profits. So go to netsuite.com slash twist, netsuite.com slash twist, and get that free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. We appreciate the work you're doing in the startup community. It's great Thanks, stuff. Thanks, pal. Thanks. All right, we'll be back with more. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can find me on Twitter at Jason and Instagram at Jason. You can follow the show at TWI Startups, both on Instagram and on Twitter. And we're active and you can DM us and you can suggest guests. And if you want to advertise, we're sold out for this year, but maybe next year. Uh, my guest today, Luke Saunders, is the CEO and co-founder of Farmer's Fridge. Did you build the first machine or did you just get something off the shelf? How does one, because I've always been fascinated by vending machines myself. Mm -hmm. There's something neat about them, isn't there? Yeah. Did you buy or build the first one? And how did you make that decision? Yeah. So, um, you know, originally I was thinking um, like a building a custom machine. Mm. And I, um, I actually thought because of my uh, metal finishing sales job, I knew some people who made machines. And yeah. You know, so I actually, I reached out to a couple of um, engineering firms and it turns out it's very expensive to build a custom machine. Like the first quote was a million bucks. <laughs> and, <laughs> what? And, and they what? were like, and they were like, uh, we don't even know if it'll work. No guarantees. And by the way, this doesn't include any software. Um, and so I was like, well, my entire startup budget for this project is like 75 grand. Um, <laughs> it's basically like the money we had saved and some credit cards and stuff. Yeah. And, they're like, that'll um, get you a keypad. Yeah. And so that wasn't an option. And no. so I kind of, I went home very depressed. So I was like, well, this idea, I think, you know, the economics have like sorted out how to make good food and all that. Um, but, uh, then someone said, well, have you thought about just using a vending machine? And I thought, and I actually said this like, no. Because I've never seen a vending machine that could like merchandise the product in the way that I'm envisioning this. And yeah. I, I don't think it can be a vending machine in the sense that if uh. people see a vending machine, they're not going to trust the quality of the food. Mm. So, um, but I didn't have any other options. So I actually got on a plane and I went to Las Vegas for the vending show. There's a show every year. Wow. Um, and I kind of walked around the show and, and found different pieces of the puzzle. And so I was able to take... Um, some off-the-shelf equipment um, and mash it together with uh, some software that was being sold and um, and like nobody was talking to anybody. I actually was walking Got the it. show and and say like, does this work with that? And they're like, no. So I, yeah, I, they're not up to APIs. Yeah, exactly. They're not on Zapier no, or if this no, and that. No, no, they're no, not no. like po pumping like updates into your Slack room. No, no. none of none of that. Not quite and, on and that so, level. Yeah. So I kind of like it was sort of this like science project mashed together. Yeah, it's a I Franken got, machine. Yeah, and and really just it was a true MVP. Like right. like how do I? And then we actually uh, wrapped it in reclaimed wood ourselves in Chicago. Perfect. Um, and did all of the like bells and whistles to make it look nice. Did it work? Um. Almost like right. it, it was, it, it could serve meals reliably like five times in a row. And then, you know, what would actually happen when we figured out, it took us like a couple of weeks, but um, people were able to jam the elevator function huh. by reaching in. Like if they ordered multiple products and reached in, in between vents, it would actually jam the machine. Uh, and then the yeah, only way to, I apologized you know, about that. I'm yeah, sorry. No, <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah. So, so it would work most of the time. Um, but, but also, uh, was like, I did, my office was the food court. Uh, um, and so anytime it didn't work, what we would do is we would, act, well, we, <laughs> maybe when nobody was looking, but no, we, we would just actually give away all the food and pretend like it was like a really busy day. Yeah. You just take this. <laughs> yeah. Like, just here, take it. and it's just all like, good. it's all good. Yeah. And, we just got to get the stuff out of here. It's going to rot in the machine. We're going to have stinking eggs in here. Yeah. In a and, and then when people would show up, we just say, yeah, we just had a great day. It was 
totally sold out. Um, and <laughs> so, it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so no, it didn't, it didn't work really great, but it, yeah. it proved that people were willing to buy lunch and that it wasn't like a novelty thing, like the, because people kept coming back and, um, and, and it ultimately like the food quality was high and the mm. user experience was actually pretty intuitive. Yeah. Um, it worked. The average price of the food is three or four dollars or something like that per so little. Our, uh, so our average ticket is like six fifty, six seventy five. Two or three items, or it includes one point two items. One point two items. Okay, um, so four bucks an item, five bucks an item. Yeah, exactly. Like five, some five and change. And I ordered it, eggs, yeah. and they were cheap. Yeah, like it should have been like two bucks. Oh, um, eggs a loss leader for you? Is that like your Costco chicken where like you're like, hey, get these eggs. And then you're like, well, now they're going to treat themselves to some pudding or something. I think I had no. a yogurt or pudding or something. Yeah. So actually our, our chicken is our loss. Like it, it's probably the, the lowest margin product. Um, what does it cost for like an ounce or two? What is it? Two or three ounces of chicken? It, yeah, it's $2. Um, and it's it's like 1.8 ounces or something last time I checked. really yeah. good actually. Yeah. It was nice and shredded and yeah. packed in there. Yep. And I just felt like I was eating healthy at an airport. It was like a really cool <laughs> feeling. I did feel a little bit of guilt because they were plastic. Plastic. Yeah. And I was like, eh, I don't want to throw this plastic jars away. I was thinking mm -hmm. about keeping them maybe because yeah. they're kind of nice. Yeah. Nope. So a lot of people keep them. Yeah. Um, and then we also have a jar return on the fridge. Right. So you and probably had already to... left the airport area, no, right? No, I or... was just at another gate. I did yeah. think about going back because I noticed that. And yeah. I guess people do do that like half the time or something. Yeah. So it really depends on the location. So like at uh, an airport, um, we get a lot of like the flight attendants and pilots will return stuff. But right. travelers typically, they'll keep it, wash it out, reuse it, or just recycle it. It, it feels like yeah. it's reusable. Like it, yeah. it feels better than like those Tupperware uh, things that you kind of reuse a couple of times. And you're yeah. like, this is so cheap. I got to throw it out. It's, yeah. it's discolored. Well, and that was the whole idea. We actually printed our name on on it because we right away uh, the first time I tested the packaging I dropped it off at a friend's house um, and I came back a week later to ask her how it went and and I noticed she had taken the jars and used them all throughout her kitchen so there was like pretzels in one and dog biscuits in another kind of precious they're really yeah. nice and I was like great I'm gonna print our they're name like on a there a little bit harder yeah. plastic like yeah, yeah it doesn't exactly feel like cheap plastic like yeah and they're really easy to clean because it's not like it's like coated in you know peanut butter or something like that no yeah. super easy yeah so. how many machines are there now uh, so we're close to 400. Wow. Yeah. Um, and you make them all yourself now? You have a contract manufacturer? How do you do it now? So it's a combination. We we basically, so we do all the software in-house. We have a of team course. of software engineers um, that do all of that. We spec all of the electronics and the electromechanical portion is like built to our spec now. Uh -huh. um, and then the, the, what we call like the shroud. So the, the thing that actually like makes the machine look nice that's mm. our design and we contract it out and so do you build get, all that in america or you have some coming from china how do you do it uh so it's it's again a mix so it's like electronics are coming from china the machine and the shroud are here um and then cheaper to build that metal shroud here the box because shipping all those would be super expensive yeah, and I think too, just like um, you know, from for what we found, like the the suppliers were, it was actually pretty easy to set them up in the U.S. and not have to go and fly twelve hours versus ordering uh, electronics through Alibaba was like you know pretty yeah. reliable. So it just depended where what we were trying to accomplish, and and we happened to find uh, really high quality suppliers like the the shroud, for example. Um, Michigan is great for furniture building. And so it turns out like if you ah. think of it as a piece of furniture, you can find you some- You free really, yourself from yeah. thinking about the metal contraption that's yes. made in some big giant factory and you're making it with studs uh, or some kind of frame. And It's more just the, um, the like the shaping of things and the cutting uh, of it and like all of the, it's the same type of fabrication. Hmm. So as long as you, you, we created the spec, like we sat down at a CNC machine and kind of like cut it all out and then pieced it together and then gave it to somebody and said, hey, can you like operationalize this to make a hundred of them? Where are these machines? We talked about airports. That's obvious. Yeah. I would think like colleges would be the no brainer and office buildings. Yeah. Where do you put them? All of those places. Yeah. Um, so again, Which the one's the mo easiest to place? Like people are just like, get it over here now. Um, well, it was funny, actually, nowhere at first. Um, we <laughs> oh, so nobody wanted it. <laughs> no, nobody wanted no, your machine that nobody, broke after five? Nobody wanted it, and it yeah. was funny. By the way, the most delightful thing that can happen when you're interacting with a vending machine yeah. is not getting what you just paid for and calling the 800 number and asking for your 75 cents. Like, why did they even put that number there? Yeah, I don't know, because I, I don't know that anyone would answer it. Um, it must be like some legal thing. I think so, actually. Like I'm going to go ahead required... and ask everybody to go get those numbers, and let's all just call, oh, and I want you to record <laughs> the call and let us know if you get your 75 cents. Like, 
it must be a legal thing. They must be required to send the 75 cent check. No questions asked. They are. And what, what a lot of people do is they actually just give like in an office, the HR or whoever's facilities manager actually has coupons from the vending supplier. <laughs> and so they'll usually just give you that as like Hilarious. a refund now. Um, but uh, in any case- So any nobody case, wanted it. No. So so when I, I, I showed up, I actually was living in Ann Arbor. Uh, finished, my wife was finishing up law school. I was like incubating the idea. And when we were getting ready to move, I quit my job and was going to open the first one in Chicago. So um, I started walking the streets of the city, going to all the places you'd expect that this would be a great fit. Um, yeah. Places like the Merchandise Mart or Willis Tower, uh, formerly Sears Tower, and just like anything that I thought of as lots of people, iconic places with a bunch of extra space, especially considering this thing was only going to be like 20 square feet. Yeah, you just put it in the lobby. What's yeah. the problem and, here? Well, a uh, apparently um, nobody was interested and actually it was funny the first place I showed up I didn't even have a picture I just said I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to pay you money for the space you're not using and they looked at me like what do you mean what does it look like how big is it I was yeah. like I had to go and actually create a 3D render I'd never done that before yeah. um, but no everybody said no because they were worried that I would compete against the restaurants of course um, and they some people just like didn't they didn't want to be the first person they were risk averse like it. who is this guy am I going to have a giant paperweight my lobby um and so we ended up in a food court that was um it ended up going bankrupt a year later so so when i say this was not a nice food court i I mean it was really not a nice food court um and they were the only place that would take us i think they actually thought they were getting one over on me because when when i walked in and they tried to lease me a space in in line in the food court and i said no like i don't think i want a storefront i think that space right down there in the middle of the food court uh I, if you have an outlet there, I'll pay you like 800 bucks for that spot. And the guy looked at me like trying to keep a straight face and was like, I'll think about it and get back to you. And like I got the lease like six hours later. Yeah, because by the way, they're charging <laughs> 600 for you have a full bone yeah, exactly. restaurant yeah. that you could have made your office and it's got a sink and a shower. And exactly. Yeah. You yeah. dummy. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you so, compete, but, you, you literally competed against yourself. You negotiated against yourself. You're yeah, like, How about eight hundred? He was like, "Ah, oh, let me get back to you on that." When I'd already, I had gotten some feedback from these other places on like yeah. what they were charging for stuff, mm-hmm. and so I knew kind of like general market, like it might be two thousand dollars at another uh. place or something. So I had I had some sense, but I just didn't want to. I was getting desperate. Nobody was saying yes, and I was like, "Look, I just need a place to open because I've already paid for this fridge." And uh-huh. if I get the fridge and it's not ringing sales, then I'm not making money, and I don't have a budget for that. Right. And so I was like, look, I just, I need a place to showcase this. I need somewhere to bring people and, and show them the fridge. And that was really um, the the way that we got our first location. So um, no. And then once we so had you're that overpaid, one, now you got it working. Yep. How do you get the college, the hospital, like these kind of places to buy in? How do you talk them into it when we get back on This Week in Start? Do you want to turn your idea, your brilliant idea, into a beautiful website. If you do, then you could build a blog and you could publish content. Maybe you could sell some products or services, promote a physical event or an online business, or maybe even announce some special project that you are uniquely qualified in the world to manifest. Well, that's where Squarespace comes in. Squarespace is the answer. They provide beautiful and customizable templates and they have powerful e-commerce functionality. Squarespace said, you know what? We'll just build that in and we'll include it in your price. And you can buy domains and choose from over 200 extensions. On top of that, they added great analytics. On top of that, they added search engine optimization, free and secure hosting. And of course, you get their award-winning 24-7 customer support. And it's all optimized for mobile. So you don't have to have this experience where you get some kid who builds your website and then you look at it on your phone and you're pinching and zooming. Uh Uh-huh, no way. Here's a little uh, demo. Associate Press is browsing templates on Squarespace. He chooses a photography template and he creates an active website within minutes. Here it is. Superhumanwallpaper.com, a site to showcase superhuman inbox zero images. And it's one of these great things where you can just build a website in minutes. So here's your call to action. I want you to go to squarespace.com right now and get the free trial. That's right. It's a free trial. They know you're going to love it. So they give anybody a free trial. But when you're ready to launch, I want you to use the offer code twist and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or even a domain name. That's right. 10% off with your first purchase. Please use that offer code twist. All right. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right. My guest is Luke Saunders. He is from Farmer's Fridge. 
You can go check him out at farmersfridge.com. He's got 400 machines uh, in the United States. Mm-hmm. First machine, yep. you could get five great products, and then it would break. He overpaid <laughs> for his first location. And uh, this thing uh, was duct tape and uh, chewing gum. But then you kind of got it working. And then I assume you go to some other places and say, hey, you want to check it out here? And you make a little teaser video, and then you start emailing and sending people like a link to it and say, hey, would you like to have food between, what was the sell? Do you want to have food when all these restaurants close overnight when the nurses are working or college kids are studying? Yeah, exactly. It was like, are you crazy? There's uh, no healthy options kind of anywhere in sight in a lot of these places. And not only are we going to solve that problem for you, but it's going to also be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and it's, by the way, cheaper than anything else. And so there was like all these selling points and, and you're not using the space. Like it just, it felt yeah. like too many things. Uh, win, 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 win. Yeah. And, and so uh, what we found out is that um, a lot of places actually had contracts with people to provide food. And so, uh. so we would go to a hospital and say, hey, we want to put a uh, fridge in here. And they would say, that's great. Um, but we have a contract with so-and-so. Oh, Food's like a, a global contract yeah, for the whole the, facility. Exactly. Like, Restaurant associates or something. Yeah, exactly. For like a vending contract or a food service contract. Oh, and God. so then Another middleman. Yeah. So then I was like, oh, I got to sell to like a, uh, these big companies. And then they'll help me sell to the client. And, and so, of course, they had no interest. They're like, this is, uh, you know, competition or we just don't have time for you, whatever it was. Um, and so really what we did, we just kept hammering away at the accounts and the customers because we were starting to build a fan base in our one location. Mm. And little by little, people, the word got out and, and it was it became uh, kind of grassroots. So like the people at the hospital were saying, like, what do you mean I can't have fresh meals because you have a contract? Like yeah. the contract is to serve us. And this is in service of us, so you should yeah. do it. And and so it just it really took um, time. Yep. And a lot of uh, grassroots like kept pushing and kept pushing. And then we we had our first couple big breaks. So we ended up in a, in a shopping mall that was on Michigan Avenue, very high profile. Um, and then people started seeing it there. And then the hospital called us up, and, and they actually called uh, one of the real estate brokers who originally uh, had not even replied to my email. And, and then, and then finally I did get them on the phone. They said, this is a great idea, but it's, it's not for us where we, we lease space to restaurants. So if we take a, this concept to the people that we're supposed to be leasing space for, they're going to think we're nuts. And, and then actually it turns out they worked for the hospital system. And so they were calling me up and say, Hey, will you come in here? And, and that was really the catalyst. Like it, it took us about a year to get the reputation and just right. really push the grassroots, um, to start to become known as a good solution for this. And then, uh, once we executed well, uh, it became like a self-fulfilling thing where, where more and more people wanted it. They knew we could execute and so on. Is there some network effect in this business where you get a hundred locations in a city, people download the app and start ordering from the app? Or does everybody just swipe their credit card and pick from the touchscreen? Is so, it 90% touchscreen, 10% app? Yeah, it, it's actually low on the app, um, mostly because it's an impulse purchase. So most people think yeah. about food and they buy food. Mm. Um we, the network effect is mostly around the economies of scale and distribution. So like you're building a route-based business uh. and the more fridges you add, the more density you build. Um, in addition, we've actually seen sales, even as we've gotten more dense, sales actually go up because people start to recognize it. They're familiar with the product, uh. start to change their routine. So they know- So just like Starbucks. Exactly. It's like, why are they open a Starbucks? There's one two blocks away. And it's like, that's why they're doing it. Yeah, exactly. Because they want to hit you twice on the way to work. Yep. You pass the first one, you're like, nah. Oh. Yeah. By the second one, you're, you're like, like, oh, cold great. Cold brew with that pumpkin spice. You try that yet? Uh, I have not tried that yet, no. I'm going to uh, go ahead and yeah. advise you to not. I just okay. had one of those the other day. It felt like it, I snorted four Adderalls. Really? I've never snorted four Adderalls. So I, <laughs> I'm assuming that's what it takes. I mean, it is cold brew Yeah, that is so powerful yeah. that I think if you drink this before 7 a.m., you're going to be wired. And it's so it's not that sweet, so it's a little bit... But yeah, they make this like, uh, yeah. So you have the real world virality, huh? Like yeah, and then also uh, menu planning, right? So we're actually- Wait, what does that mean? 
So uh, we get a lot of data on what people like. Ah. And that data actually allows us to refine the menu. Got it. And then the bigger the network is, the more tests we can run. And mm. so we can actually refine the menu faster. Right. And so it, it is, um, it's proven to be a really powerful thing. So actually when I started, uh, only 50% of people actually liked the food. They thought Farmer's Fridge was convenient. They liked the price point, but they, mm. they were going there because it was convenient and cheap. Right. And so now that number is like 95%. Because it's we, taste. Yeah, exactly. Really? So it's, it's just being- Give me like, an example or two. What did you take off the menu that was just boring AF? Uh, and uh, then you added something that was lit AF. Um, so let's see. I'm um, just trying to relate to you like Gen X to millennial. You look like yeah, a millennial. Yeah, I'm a millennial. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a Gen like, Xer, so yeah. I'm trying to keep this lit AF. You know? Okay, all right. Well, so um, a good example, we had um, like a, this, this product today, um, it's called North Napa Salad. And when we first put it on the menu, um, it was actually like pretty reasonably popular. And we started asking people like, what, what would you do to make it um, – more appealing, how would it taste to be, um, or how, what would you like to see in the salad? It's the Napa cal cabbage kind of jam. Yeah, I know exactly. about this Napa cabbage. Yeah, it's Delish. it's an awesome salad. And yeah. um, and what we found is that people wanted it to be more filling, so we added some chickpeas and the sales went up. Uh, and then they, they wanted um, a little bit of tanginess and some cheese, and so we added uh, the feta, and all of a sudden it went from like lowest performer to highest performer. Uh, um, you and, give the people their cheese. Yeah, exactly. Especially people are suckers um, for cheese. Where do, you, yeah. where, do you, where do you get bacon bits in, bits in here? You're going to be on fire. <laughs> we actually had uh, the cheater salad when I first started. Uh, was a it was meant to be kind of a provocative uh, like our one like cheat salad and it had turkey bacon and it was great. Yeah, did it sell yeah. well? Uh, it sold really well for years, and then um, you know as we cleaned up our labels and and actually made a better version of that, which today is a, a twist on a cob salad. How, how do you deal with the salads? I know this is like tactical and in the weeds, but I think it's an obvious question that people will have. How do you deal with the the dressing is the dressing in the salad already or part of the cap? Uh, it's it's in a, a tiny container at the top of the jar. Yeah, I think yeah. I remember and this. So, yeah. And so you actually pop it open, pour it in, shake yeah. it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the great thing yes. about mason jar salads. You can make them for the week. And then you pour your dressing and you shake it and it's like perfectly done yep. without having to take out like a big bowl and mix it. Exactly. Yeah. No. So, so what was the tipping point where the venture capital community embraced this idea and how did you get them on board? Because I know you raised like a $30 million round and before that you'd raise like 10 or something. Mm -hmm. How did you raise the money for this idea? Because let's face it, um, people were kicking you out of locations. They were taking your picture and posting it at the security desk. Don't let this kid in again uh, with your crazy <laughs> idea. Yes. Did um, VCs do the same thing or did they think you were crazy like a fox? Um, you know, yeah, it's just interesting. Um, so I actually had really never um, wasn't familiar with the VC world. Like I was like a small business entrepreneur, salesman, kind of, uh, and based in Chicago. Um, and so when I got started, it was really like um, I'm going to build a a nice small business. Like this is it could be impactful, but um, I wasn't lifestyle thinking, business. Yeah, like exactly. I want to solve this problem, but it can it can be a nice little hmm. like organically growing business. And all of a sudden, uh, the demand took off. And what I realized is that uh, the business needed a bunch of infrastructure to scale. Um, mm. And I needed to raise capital. So I actually um, read the book, like, How to Be Smarter Than a VC. And because uh, <laughs> actually someone wanted to invest in the business, they were like, you have no idea what you're doing. Read this book. And then I've we'll never talk. heard of this book, How to Be Smarter Than a VC. Was it good? Yeah. Yeah, it's great. It's like that if you Google like uh, VC. You know, yeah, it's it's like the number one seller on Amazon. Perfect. Um, and and you, so I, I read this book, and then I I built a pitch deck, and I went around, and and actually, uh, you know, we had like angel investors and and people like that in Chicago. Um, but I got I got really lucky. We met with a, a VC group that happened to be in Chicago for the weekend. And visiting some of their LPs and they, I fed them lunch and I thought it was kind of just like a meet and greet meeting and they made an offer on the spot. Wow. Um, and so it was a very unusual situation. We had a couple of um, angel investors lined up and they said, don't, don't go that route. You need to go the VC route. Um, and I went home, I talked about it with a bunch of people and, and decided that that was the right path. But then we really didn't fit the mold of a traditional VC business. No. At all, and so uh, it was very difficult for the next round to, you know, get people, especially um, where they they sort of actively 
don't want you to own things or move stuff around or do like operations. Yeah, they're like, make it a marketplace, sell <laughs> yeah, exactly. software to other people to make machines. Do yeah. not take this on yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and we're sort of saying like everything about this business, because we, we haven't talked about it a lot, but we, we actually make all of the food. We distribute all of the food and we own, so we own the whole experience from end to end. Right. And we're literally cutting avocados on the line, making dressings from scratch. Like that's what makes the product so it's, good. It's full stack. It's fully integrated because you have this new format. It's got to be done to your specification. I mean, of course you could outsource it, but if you outsource it, then that product is being optimized for a different reason than customer delight. Exactly. It's being optimized so that co-packer can put in the worst low quality avocados to make money off of your customers as opposed to getting your customers to come back. Exactly. That's yeah. like and 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 they're actually trying to amortize their R and D across like five different customers or twenty. <sighs> and so they're they're selling your your hard won ideas to someone else. Right. And you're educating people. Exactly. You're and like, so, cut so this, the slices like, you're like this. no, we have to do this. And so actually for our second round, most VC investors were like, this is nuts. You have no chance of success. Yeah. Um and good luck. And so, really? They told it to you like that? Uh, well, or you interpreted that? In different ways. Some people were direct. Some people just never got back to me. But you got the message, right? And how, how, when they said it in a direct way, I'm curious, how did they phrase it? Like, what was the most candid way somebody phrased it? I, the you, most brutal. Uh, you, you, this is not a VC business. You should, like, you know, not even think about it. And, right. Don't raise venture capital. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it which was, is actually like, like a, a good advice. And and actually, I was going to say, like, he was very direct, but he's also a close friend. And, and someone who I like, he actually um, worked at Redbox and was um, like the first person that educated me on how to build this company. Like I had one fridge, it was working uh -huh. and uh, he happens to be a VC. And so I went to him to get money and he was like, no, no, and, and, and touch the <laughs> exactly, ball. exactly. I'll help you, but I, I, I couldn't invest in this well, business. Well, I mean, what is, why do you think VCs don't like your business? Well, so I think it's changed. Well, and why did most not like it initially? I, I and then why do they like it now? Yeah, so I think initially yeah. um, it was really the, this idea that you had to have physical infrastructure and the scaling was going to be hard. Like we'd hear that a lot. Like how are you going to scale this up? And, you know, it just seems too hard and the, the, there's all these executional so risks. So the infrastructure and the complexity of the business made it easy for venture capitalists to say no. Yeah. and, and But and you got that first uh, slug of capital. Who Who was that bold VC who deserves credit for... Uh, yeah. When they zip through Chicago on the LP meeting. Uh, it's a firm called Great Point Ventures. Great Point Ventures, as yes. opposed to Bad Point Ventures. Great yeah, Point exactly. Ventures. Never heard of them. Where are they based? Uh, they're based here in San Francisco. Great. Yeah. Wow. Um, Big fund? Medium-sized fund? Uh, it's about a $200 million fund. They're now on their Love second it. $200 million fund. And, ah, it was yeah. their first fund when they invested in you? Yeah, we were like, one of their first investment. It. I tell this to founders all yeah. the time. Oh, my God. The best thing for a founder is to find a first-time fund. You know why? <laughs> why? Because they need to put the money to work. They got no track record and they're going to have fresh eyes and they might want to try something. Yeah, We it, say it the way we say it in the industry is they might jump the fence. They might take a risk, right? Yeah, I think that's true. I think they, they, were, they were looking at this and they were saying, we've got a lot of time mm -hmm. and we can make a bet, on, you know, a few of these like small high risk bets. Yeah. Um, and especially early in the life cycle, whether it's their first fund or early yeah. in the fund, I think they're more open to that for sure. How did you convince the uh, oldsters, the people who've been at venture capital for three decades, four decades, two or three, four decades to, you know, when they're on fund five or 10 to come in and invest in what you're doing? So I think really what changed is we were able, so we showed we could scale the company. So we had actually scaled wow. into Chicago. We were now at you know, 150 on our way to 250. It was bridges. undeniable. The yeah, traction was, like, was undeniable. Yeah, it was. And a lot of the initial objections about like, can you scale this up? Or is it a fad? Uh, you know, we had proven, we had, we'd taken a lot of the those things out of it. And we'd actually shown that we were able to leverage the data that we were collecting to optimize the menu and, and create uh, like really compounding like three, four X growth. Mm. And... So it was like, oh, this is actually a really compelling unit model. You are disrupting the way that food gets to market and in a, an environment where uh, restaurants basically have rising retail, like all, uh, all, every cost is going up. So the retail apocalypse, mm -hmm. not being able to get workers, workers, minimum wage going up, the competition for workers who are hitting the gig economy and saying, well, why would I go do a shift at this restaurant when I can do Uber whenever or Lyft whenever I want? 
Mm-hmm. And I don't have to deal with the boss dragging my ass into the same location. Just pop in my car, do a couple of rides, get out, go to the movies, and do a couple more rides or pick up my kids. Like It's hard for a fast food restaurant to compete against Uber, Lyft, and other alternatives because they pay more. Right, exactly. And, and it's you're more your flexible. own boss. Yeah. You have no yeah. boss. Really, the whole yeah. thing that people miss about the gig economy is not having a boss because bosses are a-holes <laughs> almost universally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening I, I, over there. Yeah. I'm listening over there. I'm listening yeah. over there in the engineering room. But they are. Yeah. And not having a boss is so nice and delightful. You feel agency in your life. There's nobody coming in telling you what to do. And But that was a big headwind against these restaurants. Here in San Francisco, um, the mid-tier restaurants are starting to put kiosks, um, iPads in and kiosks. Right. And you're like, yeah. wait, this is a restaurant, not with a tablecloth, but this is a restaurant with a $20 entree. Yeah, and, and I'm ordering like- f- from an iPad. Really? Yeah. And then you do it and you're like, thank you. Yeah, that was because like it was totally really, seamless. I was really annoying to have this like 20 year old like actor be really pissed off at me for their life and having to be a waiter and then get my order wrong because they're not paying attention. Like yeah. it's so nice to use that kiosk. Yeah. So I think that that's a good example where you had these um, outside forces starting to converge. So mm-hmm. like what we had been saying for three or four years, now it was very obvious. Like yeah. the business could scale, you're seeing people move to kiosk ordering. Um, the unit economics of like delivery had become more clear. So there was a bunch ah. of startups that when we were just getting started out here that were doing like individual drops. Hmm. And through, like Postmates you mean and stuff like that? Yeah, but like actually making the food and dropping it off. And, uh-uh. Yeah, um, we had a company we invested in called Bento. Okay. And then there was, a, that was doing pre-prepared meals to your home for 12 bucks and you really had to charge $15 an entree to make it work, but it was a really hard business. Exactly. And food so, waste, et cetera. Yeah, and so people kind of got it all together. Yeah. Um, and these machines, they must have gone down in cost over time. Yes. So it's things like that as we started to optimize, we were able to show like, so a big part of it was like, we were able to show we could make money on the food that we were selling. We were able ah. to, you know, just the basics of like running a good business. We were able to show that the cost of the fridge was coming down. Um, and yeah, that those we were fridges scaling I would into. think would be at least at 75K was your budget for the first. Did you go over budget, I assume? Uh, so no. And actually I, at the time it was about 25. I was able to like, oh, you wow. know, scrape That's together. Impressive. Yeah. So I was able to do, I was able to afford two plus my uh, first month's like operating costs. So 25K yeah. per. Yeah. And I'm assuming that, I'm wondering if that cost went up or down because you're making higher quality ones now that are more, less so, hacked together. So we, we spent like three years um, like three years. iterating on the box and we, we, we ultimately got it down as low as like four. Wow. And and then uh, it $4, was like- $4,000. Yeah. And then it was like, oh, that's actually a little too cheap. And so we brought it back yeah. up and, and made it a nicer experience. Um, so if it's so. 10 grand, let's say, yeah. and you're, how many of those, how much inventory is in it? Like 100, 200 of these jars, 300? Yeah, so just every location is different. Ah. So the way the system works is we're actually making fresh food every single day, like I mentioned. And then at every night, a cost function algorithm runs. And so it rebalances the load oh. in the system. So it looks at what's the real-time inventory across the network and then sends it to different places. Oh, so if they, if you don't order the Napa cabbage salad at this location, it might go to the one next door where they ran out. Exactly. So they're housing each other's inventory. Yeah, well, no. So they're not housing each other. So it's just looking at the network and then ah. rebalancing it every night. I got it. Um, but like it, in in a location like the airport, there might be a hundred or two hundred items, and then at a hospital in the suburbs, there might only be forty. Ah, and so it just it. it ranges depending on the location. Ah, so you don't have to fill it to capacity. Correct. You fill it to the right amount for that area, so you don't have waste. Exactly. And if people, one of the things that's great about this business is that if something runs out. It's not like they're looking at it and going, oh, there's no more Reese's peanut butter cups left or the, all the Coke Zero is gone. It just goes off the menu. So you don't even know there's no more Reese's pieces left. So we actually do tell people um, that, it's sold out? that it's sold out. Why, to create FOMO? Uh, it's a, no, it's more like we want to, we have a bummer button, it's called. Oh. And so we're actually measuring like how many people showed up and, and hit that bummer button oh. and didn't get what they wanted. That's fascinating. And so then the algorithm gets smarter about what to send there. Got it. We can oh. also look at like, well, did the person hit the bummer button and still buy something? Did they right. not? Like, so what? it was like Napa cabbage salad or bust. Right. And so like or what bummer. Pers- yeah, exactly. Right. Oh, yeah. so if it's bummer and I don't go for the Greek salad, you know something. You're not that bummed. Yes. You didn't find another option at another location. Right. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. 
So we, wow. we do want people to know that like these are the options. We we and we debated. We made them disappear. We brought them back. It's always been, it's iterative. I need to get a bummer button. Just like a general bummer. <laughs> just like button. hit it in your everyday I life. I love it. Like, like the, one of the great. Like, you don't have to say anything. Just press the button. You know what you are? You're like this archetypal um, product guy combined with an archetypal supply chain guy. You're like Tim Cook, Cook, plus like an Elon Musk. Because like that Elon's superpower is not only does he know product, like he's really good at product. But he's an engineer. So all that time working at your dad's like lubricant business and mm -hmm. all this like horrific suffering you did, like that actually makes you fearless, doesn't it? Like you don't have any fear of like rolling up your sleeves and doing any job. No, not at all. I actually remember we were we were sort of like running out of money every month and, and the the original uh like one of the original guys who invested was like, you're nuts. Like, what are you doing? I was like, honestly, this is like not that hard. I was, that's like, I, <laughs> I like try doing that. And like your whole family, like your house is on the line and got to like sell your car. Yeah. Um, and so when you're, when you're willing to operate at that level, it just, you, I think it's a good, uh, I'm falling in love I'm, right now. Yeah. Thank you very much. You for see the, the stars in my eyes. You just yeah. said like, I sold my yeah. car to keep my, and I'm just like, yeah. Like just love. But it's like it's it's we should if, do a graphic you know, of like me looking at him like, oh my god, I love this founder. Yeah. But did it, you it sell is your like car? The I did. So when it, when the grease in the in the that grease wasn't like a, that wasn't a theoretical. Oh no, it was a real thing. Like it was like I, I we were we needed the money and, and what kind was, of car was it? It was a like an Audi hatchback A three. Oh, it's like, a nice car. Oh, it was super nice. What did you get? Like twenty four K for that? I got exactly twenty grand for it. See, yeah. I know my cars. That's yeah. twenty grand twenty grand. Yep. And did you downgrade to like a shitty Prius or I got, a Honda I had, Fit, or you got the bus pass? No, I had, yeah, I had the bus pass. So I was I was taking the oh. subway. <laughs> um, wow, wow. Yeah, but it was it was uh, we needed that Audi to the A train. Yes, <laughs> there's <exactly>. your biography. <laughs> yeah, um, but it was like that's the kind of stuff I, I really enjoy actually about building companies is like those moments where it's like, do you have the uh, conviction to do that? Like, is yeah, that you know grit? So, yeah, you got skin in the game. Yeah. Honestly, there's so many entitled entrepreneurs out there right now who like literally, I'm like, they're like, we're running out of money. Can we get more money? And I'm like, yeah, how many people you got? They're like 27. I'm like, all right. Um, how many, if you let go of, would you be at break game? And they're like, yeah, we'd have to let go of like four people. I'm like, great. Let go of eight. And they're like, what? I'm like, yeah, just take those eight jobs and assign them to the other 19 people and then triple your runway and hit break even and they're like oh that'd be a real bummer for our culture i'm like you know it'd be the real bummer <laughs> button. out of business the real bummer button for your startup is that you show up and the padlocks on the door and everybody goes home like so are yeah. we saving 19 people or are we going to cut up the other eight bodies and eat them like this cannibalism this startup cannibalism at some point <laughs> you run out of food on the boat yeah no i, I think thankfully and somebody draws straws <laughs> And that's it. Yeah, that, I think there's also like straws. you can avoid that too by just you know originally assigning those eight things to it less people. Right. Yeah. Don't bring as many people. And that's on the actually journey. and it's it's interesting just where we've seen like we we kind of you have you have some money or you do things a little bit uh, less lean and and actually like that's what's bad for your culture. It's a, like even we just recently we got like a we finally have like an office that has like lighting and a carpet. Yeah. And it's really nice. Um, you know what you should do? Yeah. You should chop up your CMO and make a little CMO feta salad. And then just, <laughs> no. Everybody well, we said you could save, you're going to save like 2%. We, we were about Great. to order like the new desk. And I'm like, what's wrong with the Ikea desks that we have? Like we have a you brand. You have Ikea desks? Yeah, exactly. They're like, what? You, Not, know. you know what Jeff Bezos made everybody do? Yeah. You don't I, know the, the story? Doors. I, I the think, doors. I think the IQ you, desks are actually cheaper than the doors. They I, are. I swear. So that's like, good. That's good. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, like we could get the doors. You make them put them together themselves? We, we we did originally. We had to stop because like some people were coming in didn't know how to use a screwdriver, and and we're yeah. putting the legs on backwards, and then the desks were unsafe. So there's like a limit. We we did it for probably the first twenty five, and then we like. And then you're like, you know what? I just yeah. need you in the sales department to yeah, start exactly. dialing for dollars. Like, <laughs> you exactly. don't need get, to put your desk to together work. and have it collapse on your ankle. And exactly. Then I've got you in a cast. Right. <laughs> and, and then there's like workman's comp off. and stuff like that. Exactly. But um, so four hundred machines. Mm -hmm. I heard you're in New York, the Big Apple. We are. That's not, th that's Broadway. How did it We're, fly? We actually have a fridge, 225 Broadway. We'll oh, really? 225 yeah. Public Broadway? Fridge, yeah. That's down by uh, City Hall Canal Street area? Yep. Yeah. 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 Where? Like Dwayne Street or something? Where is it? 
Uh, one of the federal, one of the federal it, it's, buildings? It's further down. It's further south. It's, it's, I'm not sure exactly the cross street, but it's, it's closer to the World Trade Center. Yeah, that's right yeah. where Casey Neistat's place yeah. is. Um, he's at 360-something, 360 Broadway. Yeah. yeah. Um, how's it going in New York? Because New Yorkers, I mean, people in Chicago are difficult, and people in New York are impossible. I mean, you're dealing with, like, they're going to really high-end restaurants. They're very high-end people. Yeah. And they do not take any bullshit. How have you fared in New York? Is it different launching in New York? So I think... It, it's different. You always have, you want to really be cognizant of like new markets and, yes. and the differences. And that I, was your I, second? I, it, was, it was our, it was our first outside the mid Midwest. Mm. And I'm originally from New Jersey. So I know everything you're talking yeah. about. I lived yeah. in New York for a few years. Yeah. And the bar is definitely really high. If I'd started this company in New York, I'd definitely- would have burned the machine I, down. Oh, I would have been They would have thrown business. it down the subway stairs. Um, and so, you know, part of the thinking was we'd actually reached a point where we could uh, really like execute at a high level. Huh. And, um, and, and we have a team of people that are making sure that this happens really well. Yeah. And what was um, the reaction? And, and so far, the reaction's been great. So actually, like that was the, the, the thing that, again, back to the first fridge, is turns out, that people uh, everywhere, including in New York, just want food to be more convenient, cheaper, and taste good. Yeah. And so if you provide that, it doesn't actually, like, is, so again, we're not, like, if we were charging $15, like, the bar might be higher. Yeah. We're charging 7 and it's in New York. And so people are actually thrilled yeah. that they're getting, uh, uh, they're saving money. And what's even more is the cost of living is so much higher in New York that uh, the relative value is actually higher. It's bonkers. They're probably yeah. like, this is ridiculous. It's a bargain. When you're in New York and you find a place with a buck fifty slice of pizza, you bookmark it. Yeah, exactly. You're like, wait a second. Everybody yeah. is charging three dollars. And I had mine because we we had farmer's fridge in New York in the nineties. Yeah. It was these little boxes. And it was a Pakistani guy on the corner, uh, who I became friends with, and he would see me walking down the corner. And these guys like their drinks with a lot of milk and sugar in it. He'd see me coming and I'm watching him. And he starts scooping the sugar. And he, when you say you want a sugar, they put like four spoonfuls of sugar. Then you want milk. It takes, the he, it takes the heavy cream, the milk. Boom, he's pouring it in. I would get this thing. It would look like I had milk and somebody spilled their coffee in it. And then he would give me that big crawler. <laughs> yeah. 50 cents for the crawler, 50 cents for a big, large coffee. Give me a big crawler, big coffee for a dollar. Yeah. That's New York. That was the original from well, and, and, I, and just like same kind of health profile. Yeah, exactly. Like very, very, I mean, very crawlers, similar. I don't know where yeah. they made them in Hoboken or whatever, but there was some donut shop in Hoboken where they were making crawlers that I swear was the size of a baby's arm. It was gigantic. <laughs> yeah, no, actually and it was funny, like is a one of the things that kind of planted the seed for Farmer's Fridge is is similar. When I was working in, in Long Island City, there was a guy in the corner and he had mm. this like um Euro stand. Yeah, and he was like he I, he would get there at like five in the morning. Yeah, they had to get the spot, and he he would he would make food. He'd sell it all by like two o'clock. Yeah, and then he would be there until like eight o'clock at night cleaning the thing. Yep, and then he'd be back again at five a.m. the next morning. No, and you and, saw him at five, but he he had to pick the thing up at three thirty and drive it and drag it in Manhattan. Yeah, I used to get up early sometimes or come home late. In fairness, sorry, mom. Um, <laughs> And at like four o'clock in the morning, you would see these guys going from the West Side Highway, the same Pakistani guys, and it was like a great migration. They would be carrying those boxes where they would sit in like a toll booth box and they would drag them from, you know, 11th Avenue all the way to Broadway. I mean, this must have been a hell of a workout. Yeah. That's entrepreneurship there. Not these people who are like, you know, the LaCroix out, <laughs> kind bars. So what's going on? You and Sweet Green got beef? Uh, you and no, Sweet Green got I don't think so. I think that's a great, like it's, um, you know, for educating people about like high quality ingredients mm. and it, it's just a completely different business. Yeah, but mind. you were telling me before we got on here that they're ripping people off with those $18 salads. You didn't I, say I that. did not mention anyone by she name. Did, she did. She did. I didn't. I, you did I, mention an $18. You spent $15 I, on the salad. I said $15 on the salad. Okay, I infer, you say $15 from a salad, I infer Sweet Green. No, I think there's there's a lot of places you can get a $15 salad. A lot of people salad. are ripping people off with $15 and, and, salad. And actually, to be fair, I think those places are charging what it costs to yeah, make, Yeah, they might right? not be that profitable. It, so I, I think there there's definitely, uh, it's, a, it's a different structure. And so it, it's more about, um, when I think about it a lot, is um, affordability. So, mm. so when you think about, you know, San Francisco, I don't really think it's a, a huge problem for the people working at a tech firm to pay, <laughs> you know, but I- 
when you look at the average American, they have yeah. less than fourteen dollars a day to spend on food. Right. And so if a, if if an item at a QSR restaurant is fifteen bucks, it's like literally negative one meal. Like you can't. It doesn't compute. Yeah, it doesn't um, make sense. And so it's more. I think for me, just how do we how do we remove any extraneous things in the supply chain and make food cheaper at th- that higher quality level? Could I eat a full meal for under ten, eight? Uh, so you could like three a, items is a full meal. Yeah, I mean, three, like a, a, like five to six hundred calories. So like we actually comp like how many calories can you buy at a farmer's fridge versus a subway. Ah. And we're, that's like our right now kind of the metric that we look gotcha. at. It's like, are we providing calories at least as cheaply as Subway? And okay, so you're as affordable. You want to use the word cheap, affordable yeah. as Subway. Correct. But the ingredients are at least 10x better. <laughs> that's your I words, can say not that. mine. I, <laughs> you ever see those olives? <laughs> yeah. Those things, I, I don't think they ever changed the olives. I think they just dumped them on top. So one of those olives in there has been in there since Clinton was president. I'm sure of it. <laughs> they just keep dumping olives in. It's like this giant olive. It's like a sourdough. It just keeps going. Yeah, it's like it gives it some flavor. Um, you know what's amazing about I? People are so woke and angry and outraged at everything. But I, I did a tweet the other day. I couldn't believe it. Um, how affordable roast chicken is. Do you yeah. know about this? Four ninety nine uh, at Costco. And did you read the article about how they 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 actually bought the chicken farms, Costco? Yes, it's so popular. It's a hundred thousand a day, I think. Is it's that right? Un- yeah, it's something bonkers. Yeah. Somebody look it up. I think there's a New York Times story. We'll throw it up on the screen. Um, uh, Saint Nick, and this thing, five dollars, you get a roast chicken. And I tweeted, "What a triumph of capitalism that you can get a roast chicken that feeds what does that feed three people?" I mean, I would say. Probably four, like a family of four. For okay, five family bucks. of four. But yeah. and then you can Not have five. some. You have some money left over to get some vegetables and stuff. All right, let's just go with three. Yeah. Three people are eating protein for a dollar fifty. You spend five dollars on vegetables. That's a heck of a lot of vegetables. Now you're at ten dollars. It's three dollars a person to have a fully healthy meal. And you know what people did? They went crazy on me that I don't understand how poor people are and how poor people can't afford to go to Costco. And I said, wait a second, Costco is designed for poor people and for middle-class people to have their dollars extend. That's the whole value proposition. The food supply system is an incredible triumph in America, is it not? Yeah, I think that we are able to provide extremely cheap, reliable calories to a lot of people. Too many calories is the issue now. We've actually crossed the Rubicon. The system is so good at what it does that our problem is no longer starvation or money. It's getting fat. Yeah. And I think if you go back like 150 years, you'd have people that like on a regular basis were starving because there was like shortages of food or it was too expensive. And so to your point, like I I do think that we we've done a very good job of making food very cheap and reliable. And And the mistake is. I think that there's um, like a miscalibration in the quality of calories. Mm. So if you look at the, like we have a chart that we look at and, and so uh, things like high sugar, high salt, high fat, all that stuff has gotten much cheaper over the last 50 years. High salt, high fat is cheaper. Yeah. All that's getting cheaper. The bad stuff. And, and actually fruits and vegetables are getting more expensive. Right. They're and, still affordable overall, but they are. But on a relative purchasing power, they're actually getting more expensive. Really? Yeah. And so, so that's mm-hmm. really when you look at it, it's it's the basket that people are being able to get is mm-hmm. is a bit mixed up. See, it, that was weird because I thought like getting a Snickers bar today. Uh, that's got a couple hundred calories, I'm guessing, and that costs what two bucks? Yeah, maybe less if you get it at Costco. Okay, buck fifty for a Snickers. I'm not yeah. talking king size. Take it easy yeah, over there. Okay. <laughs> you getting that king size? Yeah, let's just go with the regular like Snickers. The whole, the whole bag. That's a buck fifty. How many? What is a? How many bananas do you get for a buck fifty? Three, four? I don't know. It's, isn't it like twenty, thirty cents for bananas? That might be another loss leader. I play. Yeah, I was gonna actually say like I think we can get a banana for like ten cents, under All ten right. cents. So like, like twenty like, cents a banana. Yeah. You could get like six bananas for the price of a Snickers bar. What we have to realize in this country is that. People actually do have competitive choices and are making bad decisions, right? How much of this is people's own responsibility? I mean, you're providing a really quick, easy option, so that's helpful. But people still have to say, I want to eat some chicken and eggs and salad as opposed to eating a Snickers bar and a slice of pizza. So, I, I mean, I, so I actually, I think where we, we probably are on this, a similar wavelength is in terms of like how the economy drives certain, like in a, at a macro level, like mm. we've really triumphed in making cheap food more available right but the, the 
you know, to me, it's actually like you, you make the wrong kinds of calories much cheaper. Yeah. And again, on a calorie per calorie basis, yep. it is much cheaper to get a, like a Snickers bar has 250 calories. Ah. You know, so like, I think when you make it apples to apples and-, and, and Yeah, not so just, if we actually looked at apples, which yeah, might be- They're like 80 to 100. Calories, so you gotta yes. buy like four of them versus, to be a Snicker. Versus like a bag of chips, right? Or some oh, French fries or, or actually like a, a soda. So I, I think mm. when you actually look at like the whole picture, um, th- there's quite a bit of cheap, high calorie food. And the other thing about it is it's it's not easy to regulate how much you eat. It's so not, the food is designed me. to make you want to eat a lot of it. The other thing is the distribution system, you uh, may not know this, but uh, in my research, I found that it takes up to six months for stuff to get to <laughs> yeah, consumers. Exactly right. Where we started. Yeah. But it actually yeah. is the fault of the distribution system as well. Selling shelf stable fast food, the Snickers bar could be a year old, doesn't taste any difference. The chips could be three, four, five months old, doesn't taste any difference, I think. Maybe chips is a bad example. But an apple that's six months old versus six days old is a big difference. Mm -hmm. And you are doing a huge mitzvah for humanity by taking this very uh, operational technical problem and getting people affordable food at the right price. Yeah. And I think like on on principle to your point is my whole thesis was if I just make it cheaper and more convenient than unhealthy food, Mm. it will actually change the way people eat. So I I think that's the the big difference is getting Any announcements? You got any announcement, um, anything you want to share? Because we can hold the episode for when that drops. Uh, so, you know, the, the the New York thing, we actually haven't really talked about it a lot. We've, we've gone from zero to 100 fridges over the last few months, and we are going to be announcing it over the next few weeks. Wow. Yeah. And how do you get 100 deployed in locations? You figured that out. How did you figure out the location? You got a team that just does that? Yeah, that's all we do. And we, we have actually um, like distribution partners. So we work with now that the big food service companies that wanted to not work with us at the beginning now see this as a huge benefit because we're able to provide fresh, healthy meals 24 yeah. hours a day in places that they can't service. And they um, get paid what, like 20, 30% of whatever you sell? Oh no, it's it's fresh food. So the margins are much lower than that. So they um, get four points or five yeah, points or something exactly. like that. Yeah. So they're like a tax, but they are also, uh, if you do do it right with them, they become this incredible um, grease on the wheels to getting you into those locations. Exactly. A great lubricant. Yes, yeah, back to, to the lubricant Back days. to the lubricant, yeah. okay. Listen, Luke, continued success. Congratulations on hitting 100 in record time. Um, if you want to work for Farmer's Fridge and help people get great food, go to Farmer'sFridge.com. You know, you never know. Maybe email Luke at Farmer'sFridge.com. We'll pick up. Uh, you're looking for developers. You're looking for salespeople. What are you looking for? All of the above. So uh, engineers, salespeople, um, those are the big ones right now. Operations. We're a very mm-hmm. operationally intense business. It's going to be a public company. You're I, going to get to 10,000 machines and you're going to go public. I think we, we want even more than that. I think you're going to get to 10,000 go public, and then it's sky's the limit after that. I really, I really want to congratulate you, Luke, uh, from your dad's failing business, selling the Audi, and here you are, 100 machines in New York. Corporate strategy's open. There you go. That's the first person who draws straws is a corporate strategy person. <laughs> We're going to make a corporate strategy, uh, corporate strategy brisket. It's coming up if we have a little startup cannibalism. All right, we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>